Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph be blessed now and forever in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have this beautiful feast today, the 2nd of February, the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and also the presentation of our Lord Jesus in the temple, this double header, this great feast of Jesus and Mary. Remember also, before I forget today, Pray especially for religious around the world, globally, who will make their reconsecration, consecrate themselves anew to the Lord through Our Lady. With the Feast of the Purification ends the sanctoral cycle of the season of the Epiphany. It is the oldest feast of Our Lady, and in Rome in the seventh century, it was ranked after the Assumption. The feast is kept today, February the 2nd, because Mary, wishing to obey, as we know, this Mosaic law, had to go to Jerusalem 40 days after the birth of Jesus to offer the prescribed sacrifices according to the law. Mothers were to offer a lamb, or if their means did not allow, two doves or two young pigeons. Candlemas Day is also, today is also another name for the feast of the presentation of the Lord. Forty days after his birth, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple for the rites of purification and dedication as prescribed by the Torah. According to the book of Leviticus, chapter 12, when a woman bore a male child, she was considered unclean for seven days. On the eighth day, the boy was circumcised. This we know for our Lord when he was given this the holy name of Jesus. The mother continued to stay at home then for another 33 days for her blood to be purified, to be made clean. After the 40 days, the mother and the father then, as tradition dictated, came to the temple for the rite of purification, which included an offering of a sacrifice, a lamb for a holocaust, a burnt offering, and a pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering of a poor people who could not afford the lamb, two pigeons or two turtle doves. No, Joseph and Mary made the offering of the poor. Also, Joseph and Mary were obliged by the Torah, this Jewish law, to redeem the firstborn son. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, consecrate to me every firstborn that opens the womb among the Israelites both of man and beast, for it belongs to me, Exodus 13. The price for such redemption was five shekels, the five wounds of Jesus Christ, which the parents paid to the priest. This redemption was a kind of payment for the Passover sacrifice by which the Jews had been freed from the yoke of slavery. Simeon, then, in this beautiful account in the scripture today, a just and pious man who awaited the Messiah and looked for the consolation of Israel, was inspired to come to the temple. He held the baby Jesus in his arms and blessed God, saying these beautiful words, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace. You have fulfilled your word, for my eyes have witnessed your saving deed, displayed for all peoples to see, a revealing light to the Gentiles, the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon then thereby announced that the Messiah has come not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile, for me and you, not just for the righteous, but for the sinners. So the presentation is also a proclamation of Christ, Messiah, and priest, Lord and Savior. He is the light who came into this world to dispel sin and darkness and free us from the slavery of the devil. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we never lose the opportunity to speak of Mary, especially today 
on that piercing sword that wounded the most immaculate heart and illuminating her role as co-redemptrix of humanity. Mary is given at this moment, the moment of the presentation, a special infused knowledge as to her mission to assist the redemption of man with the most perfect redeemer, Jesus Christ, her son. The pathway to Calvary is already mapped out in her most exquisite soul. Saint Alphonsus de Liguori says that the suffering, that suffering is everyone's lot in this valley of tears. And all of us must put up with the evils and miseries of that are involved in our daily lives and occurrences. Yet how much more, he says, how much more anxious life would be if we knew already what was in store for us, if we could see the future, the future cross. God is merciful then by not allowing us to foresee these crosses that are in store, that he has waiting for us. It is a blessing that whatever it is we have to endure, we only have to suffer it once. But this was not so for Mary. Our Lord was not so compassionate towards Mary. He willed that she should be the queen of sorrows and that in all things like his son. And so Mary was obliged to have continually before, this is the important word, before her eyes, all the torments that awaited her, especially the, her participation in the sufferings of the passion and the death of her beloved Jesus. Remember when our lady was born, she was already with this great knowledge, the infused knowledge of the scripture, already participating in the core redemption. She was praying up until the Annunciation for the mother, for the, the person who would be the mother of Christ. She was in effect praying for herself. She had great knowledge then and she was had the knowledge that she was selected to be the mother of the Christ at the Annunciation, but she had even greater light at the presentation that her own heart would be pierced by this sword. In the temple, Saint Simeon had received the divine child in his arms and predicted that this child would be a symbol of contradiction and persecution for all people. Behold, this child is set, he said, for a sign which shall be contradicted. Then he added the dreadful prophecy, and your own soul a sword shall pierce, referring to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary so told Saint Matilda that when Saint Simeon pronounced these words, all her joy changed into sorrow. Remember that this mystery is also the fourth joyful mystery. We have the sorrow to follow the joy. Also, if you fall in this beautiful novena to Saint Joseph, this is the fourth joy of the fourth sorrow of Saint Joseph, the presentation in the temple. For it was revealed to Saint Teresa, although Mary already knew that the life of her son would be sacrificed for the salvation of the world. She then received the most explicit knowledge and learned in greater detail what sufferings and what a cruel death awaited him. She knew that, she, that he would be persecuted and opposed in every way. But Mary, on the other hand, received this message with the greatest calm, the announcement that her son would die. She submitted to this news peacefully. Yet what grief she must have suffered, living daily in the presence of this devoted son, hearing him the words of eternal life, edified day after day by his sacred conduct. But, oh God, it was for 33 years that Mary had to endure such sorrow. Can you imagine normally a mother whose son is afflicted by some injury always finds out about the event after the, fact, after the fact and always would like to take the injury from the child itself to compassionate the child. Not so for the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary had to look in advance all of these years in her mind's eye, in her heart, to, to perceive what Jesus was to suffer. The Blessed Virgin Mary revealed to Saint Bridget that when 
she was on earth, there was not a moment that this sorrow did not pierce her soul. She said, whenever I looked at my son, whenever I wrapped him in his swaddling clothes, whenever I saw his hands and feet, my soul, my soul was enveloped in grief, for I realized that he would be crucified. It was also revealed to St. Bridget that our afflicted mother, already aware what her son was to suffer, thought of the gall and the vinegar when she suckled him, of the cords that would bind him when she swayed him, of the cross to which he would be nailed when she carried him in her arms, of his death when he slept. Whenever she dressed him, she reflected that his clothes would one day be torn from him so that he could be crucified. And when she gazed at his sacred hands and feet, she thought of the nails that would one day pierce them. Then, as Mary again told St. Bridget, my eyes filled with tears and my heart was tortured with grief. This is the lot of the Blessed Virgin Mary, our sweet mother. The evangelists say that as Jesus grew older, he also advanced in wisdom and in grace with God and man. Thus, how much more must Mary have grown to love him? Yet at the same time, her love increased all the more did her sorrow increase at the thought of having to lose him by such a cruel death. So we can imagine every instant Our Lady's love for the, the blessed child grew, grew and grew, but also likewise her sorrow. The nearer the time of the passion approached, the more deeply the sword of sorrow foretold by Simeon pierced the heart of the mother. An angel revealed that in so many words to St. Bridget, again when he told her that the sword of sorrow approached the Blessed Virgin Mary hour by hour as the time for the passion of her son drew near. Our king and his holy mother did not refuse to suffer the most cruel pains throughout the life for our sake. Should we not then, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, complain if we too have to suffer something in our lives? We thank Jesus Christ today, our Savior, presented in the temple as the light of the nations for the gift of allowing Mary, our mother, to be the co-redemptics of mankind, suffering the pains, all the pains of the passion for our salvation and the lance of love on Calvary, which pierced her heart to open up the gates of paradise for each and every one of us. Amen. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.